good morning. Yes, and Merry Christmas as well. For those of you that don't know me, it's okay. I used to work here. <laughs> now, Pastor Isaac ran into a, a few health issues this week, and Pastor Richard asked if I could step in. And it's really neat how God always prepares you for things. And God had been working this message on my heart for quite some time. Because I look at the world today and I think, what is happening? And God's word assures us of where we are and where we're going and how we can deal with things and still have peace in a world that's falling apart. Amen. Yeah. Do want to wish you happy holidays. Merry Christmas this morning. This is not a Christmas message, but in, in a way it is. Because just as Jesus came, he's also going to return, right? So every time we celebrate his birth, we're also celebrating his return. Amen? Amen? I felt led by the Holy Spirit this week. I was actually looking at something else, and then he reminded me of this study where he's had me for a while. And uh, if you'll turn with me to 2 Thessalonians... In chapter 2, I think we're going to just look at verses 1 through 12 this morning. As I mentioned, as we look at the world around us, many of us see and sense some real drastic changes in our society. Um, but they, this seems to line up with prophecy from the Bible. And as we look at our government, many of us wonder what our leaders are thinking. Uh, I know we see so many illogical and, uh, in my opinion, detrimental decisions being made among those that are leading our nation. And this huge division that's beginning to take place between liberal and conservative views. And then now we're recently seeing these uh, Christian conservative politicians taking firm, bold stands to stop this downward spiral of common sense and understanding. I want to tell you every week I'm praying for our Christian political leaders. Um, I don't know. I pray for, for all of them, but especially those that will stand up and say, this isn't right and here's why. Got to pray for those guys. I can't imagine what they go through. And as we, we see these issues going on around us, the only way we're going to have any peace at all is to look back at what God's word says about the day we live in. And we can do that with a lot of the Bible today. And uh, that's where I think of the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Thessalonian church uh, is not only relevant for today, because remember, he was telling them of things that will come to pass that we're beginning to see now. But it's certainly prophetic, as Paul was writing. He tells us, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think this brings peace to our hearts um, when, we, when we have an understanding. Why is this happening? And God tells us. So let's get into this this morning. Um, I, as Again, I believe this is not only written to the Thessalonian church, but I believe it's written to the Paceonian church. That doesn't work, does it? Okay, never mind that. It's written to the modern church. And as we consider in context the purpose for why Paul was writing 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, we realize that uh, the church in Thessalonica, in this as he wrote to them, he told them about the end times. He told them about how Jesus would return for the church and what we call the rapture or the catching away of the church. And he told them that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And as we also see from 1 Thessalonians, that the church there was going through persecution 
the apostle verifies that in this second letter, and things began to get a little scary for them. So the purpose of 1 Thessalonians was to comfort them that Jesus would finally prevail and eventually take the church to heaven with him. And as the persecution there in Macedonia began to increase, evidently some of the the church leaders in the region began to teach and even send letters out that Jesus had already come for the church and that they were now in the great tribulation, the great tribulation period or age that Jesus taught in um, Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> so this is why the apostle wrote this second letter to the church to assure them that the great tribulation had not begun and to give them and us assurance that there would be significant, clear signs that would take place in order to help believers <clears throat> to know for sure what time they were living in, the day that they were living in, what's going on around us. So let's look at this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He writes to the church and says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and our gathering together with, to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word, or even if someone sends a letter as if it was from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day <clears throat> will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That word means destruction. The son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And just a note here, Jesus verified what Daniel the prophet said, and during the tribulation, the Antichrist will walk into the rebuilt temple and tell the world that he is God. That's what he's revealing or speaking of. He's referring to the prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 through 9. <clears throat> Paul tells them in verse 5, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining that he, speaking of the Antichrist, the man of sin, may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains, speaking of restraining the Antichrist, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless, none, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of of his coming. And Mike Wing would say, glory. <laughs> <clears throat> then verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Powerful passage of scripture. As we consider this, Paul, by the Holy Spirit, makes it clear. He's addressing the coming of the Lord Jesus for some reason, my advancement's not working here. I'm not sure why. Um, so I'll raise my hand when we want to change the slide. If you can, can you do that, Lazy, or is it froze up? So in this place, Paul makes it, to me, he makes it clear. And if it can make it be clear to me, a child of the 70s, it should be clear to most people. Amen. Um, Paul urges the church not to be troubled. He's speaking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and, notice verse 1, the gathering 
of the church with him, which points to the catching away of the church, Paul declared in 1 Thessalonians 4. So Paul urges the church not to be troubled by these letters and things people would say and assures them that the day of Christ had not come. And you might even uh, text Pastor Richard. He'll come in and reset that for us if it's froze up. So, And also because he's your dad. <laughs> Don't you love small churches? <laughs> so he's assuring them and us, and I'll tell you why. We will know the same things that he told them to know. <clears throat> because... He says, you're going to see this great falling away from God. And then the man of sin or Antichrist will be revealed. So let's look at this thing called the falling away. The Greek word is apostasia. It simply means to depart. And the Greek and Hebrew, they are, they're often really controlled by the context of what's before them and after them. I'm not a Greek student or scholar, but I have several books of scholars and they tell us these things and I say, it's all Greek to me. <laughs> so the context here, which is so important when you interpret scripture, the context seems to point to a falling away from the truth of God in verses nine through 12. And even though throughout time throughout the Christian age, there's been many that have rejected the truth of God. But it appears, to me at least, in the last 100 years of time, beginning in Europe and now in the United States, there's been a growing trend in society to reject, openly reject the truth of God, even among Christian churches, as Pastor Isaac has been pointing out to us recently. And without going into a long diatribe on this issue, I think we could just look at the reality of the world around us today and uh, say there's enough evidence to support this idea that the world is turning away from God. Would you agree with that? It seems that way to me. Um, there has been a growing <clears throat> departure from the reality of God, which is ever increasing today, as a whole in this world, which the apostle Paul also described when he was writing to a young pastor named Timothy. He spoke of this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. And as I mentioned some scriptures, you might want to write them down. I know as a, a young Bible student, I would get in uh, at a Calvary chapel and they would mention scriptures. I'd write them down. And then that afternoon, I would read back through the text and look at the scriptures in the word. God tells us to meditate on his word. And uh, I used to meditate at that time on the, the, the San Diego Chargers. They were my football team. And then they just got crushed. First division playoff. 11 in one team. And I was done with football. I mean, I still watch it because my wife likes the Cardinals. And she, I like it when she yells at the referees uh, on TV. But... Um, uh, I think that's funny. And the dogs think it's funny too. But um, in that place, I realized, man, I want to spend that time just meditating on God's word because that word was given to me today and it really helped me a lot. So I encourage people to take notes, especially if you're going verse by verse through the Bible, this exposition of God's word, it, it tr becomes a tremendous benefit to, to work in our minds because our minds affect our perception of how we see things. And, and we need to see things in a biblical way, wouldn't you agree? Not in the way the world sees things. So there are some Bible teachers um, over time that have seen this falling away that Paul speaks of here as the rapture that takes place, which to me seems feasible um, because of the, the word base, meaning departure. Uh, although some Greek scholars say a closer work uh, or look at the usage from the Greek appears to support a rebellious stance in departing from the truth, which is the singular meaning, a departing. The context from verse 9 and 10 in this passage seem to, to point to a rebellious departing from God. 
at least to my mind. But I think both of these views are acceptable from the language and from what we see in the world. We see, beginning to see this huge departure from God. And if you're a believer today, you're going to see the rapture of the church because you're going to be in it. And even if you're not a believer, you're going to watch it happen. And then you'll know everything God said was true. So in this place, either view to me seems acceptable because both are and will happen in the sequence the apostle prophetically declares here, which good Bible teachers support as well. From some of the commentaries I've accessed, good Bible scholars are saying both views can be accepted within the context. But many of them say this is more pointing to a rebellious departure from God. And I'm thinking, that's what we're seeing right now. We're beginning to see this. Paul said, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed from verse 3. So we're seeing the beginning of this rebellion toward God and we're seeing it become more popular. We're also seeing many more things start to take place that are being set up for what I call the tribulation age. We're seeing things and laws trying to be put in past today like, you know, these are just things I see. That I'm not taking a political stance on anything, but we see big push for gun control. We see big pushes for mandating certain things that people aren't too sure about. We're seeing the government take more control and control people's lives in a way that we've never seen before in just the last two years. And I'm thinking, man, Jesus is knock, knock, knock at the door right now. At least that's what I feel. And uh, that's why God gave me this message a while back just to calm me down. Because I was getting all, you know, fired up. It's like, what are these guys doing? You know, it's like, hey, settle down. I'm at work here. You're just seeing the results of what's happening. So I settled down. Can you tell? <laughs> Uh, we see this beginning of this rebellion toward God become popular. I mean popular. We see that people that stand for the truth of God and the belief in God through Christ become labeled as nutcases. The, the, all over the world, if you believe in this Jesus myth, you might as well believe in Santa Claus. I've had people say that to me. And I just smile and I tell them, what the end of this message says because they're going to see it one way or the other they're going to see it so um, this prophecy that we look at is for today because over time we've never seen these things begin to to rev up like a tachometer on a motor it's revving up and that's what that word in the greek talks about in prophecy coming quickly so it's revving up we also see a world in turmoil. Wouldn't you agree? Kingdoms rising up against kingdoms that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 24. World powers vying for ultimate control. No, they don't want to kill us. They want to control us. And they want everything that they make be in the store where you buy them. Sound familiar? Go in the store next time and look at where it's made and you'll get my point. This is control economic control. <clears throat> and certain leaders in America appear to have facilitated this. It's part of the end times. Don't get too upset. <clears throat> we see a prophecy in the Bible pointing to the, the church just suddenly vanishing. We see prophecy pointing to a coming war in the Middle East with catastrophic consequences Ezekiel 38 and 39. The timing I'm not sure about, but I think the rapture of the church and Ezekiel's war, they're just going to be like, boom, boom, boom. And the world will be in chaos. And the world will begin to cry out for peace. There will be turmoil. And they will say, we need a savior. And they will get one called the Antichrist. The church will be gone. All because the world rejected almighty God's Christ. So they will receive Satan's Christ. 
the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, verses three and four. And, uh, you know, just for information, you probably know this, but the, the Antichrist is kind of like antipasta. You know, it doesn't mean necessarily that he's anti-Christ. It means the actual Greek form means like him. That people will think he's the Messiah. And the prophecies tell us that. Jesus said that. You won't receive me, but you'll receive one that comes in my name. <clears throat> so we're watching all of this rev up, right? <clears throat> the removal of the true church. This worldwide chaos, the desire for peace, the man of sin coming on the scene, it says here with, with miraculous abilities. Man, talk about charisma. And I thought Obama had charisma. This guy will make Obama look like a Boy Scout, right? Sorry, Obama. When I heard him speak at the Democratic con Convention, the year, two years before he was elected, I told my wife, that's going to be the next president. She goes, how do you know? I said, did you hear what he said? Did you watch how he moved? He has demonic influence. And that's when we started seeing this thing downturn. We watched these things being put in place, dismantling the power of America. And now we're, we're economically... You know, at a place where, you know, anybody with half a mind that says, you want how many trillion? We're already to the ceiling in debt. You want to do what? So, boy, these are the times we live in, right? And there's a reason for it. It's interesting that the church at Thessalonica had been clearly taught by Paul of a pre-tribulational rapture, removal from the church, or they would not be concerned that the rapture had taken place. It's kind of a side note here, but it's one of the reasons I firmly believe in a pre-tribulational rapture of the church, but there are hundreds. And we have a lot of good resources here to help you study those things so that you don't have to believe what people say. You can just study the Bible, and the Holy Spirit will show you the truth. And I think it's very important, and I'll tell you why. If there's a pre-tribulational rapture of the church, we know that he could come right now. And that's really going to affect the way I live in life. If I'm waiting for the Antichrist to come on scene, you know, I know my own flesh is kind of like, well, you know, I'll deal with some of this stuff when I see that happen. I've actually had people say that to me. I'm like, man, you're headed down a slippery slope. He's coming. Could be today. Are you ready for him to come today? Or are you living in sin apart from faith in God, thinking you're going to straighten this out when you see the Antichrist? We're not waiting for the Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ, right? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so in this place, Paul teaches them of a pre-tribulation rapture because they thought they got left behind. And Paul here tells them and us, you are not in the tribulation age, which is a literal seven year period of time, according to the prophet Daniel chapter nine, which verifies what Jesus taught in Matthew 24. Actually, Jesus verified Daniel's teachings as valid. Some people get into an argument, is it going to be a Babylonian calendar during that time or a Gregorian calendar we use now? The prophet Daniel said that the Antichrist will seek to change times and seasons. So I bet they're going back to a Babylonian calendar. It's another way to put their hand up to God, in a sense. There's going to be a lot of changes during that time. Um, as I said, the church will be gone. Um, Paul is, is assuring them they're not in the tribulation. And you'll know that if you're in the tribulation, you'll see this worldwide apostasy grow and come to fruition. And then you'll see a one world ru ruler rise to power with unnatural abilities, the Antichrist. Although there has been teaching by early scholars uh, in the modern age, which has become 
what we call a, a historical tradition in Bible teaching, that the Antichrist is really just a fallen world system and not a specific person. Uh, it's a view supported by, if you're Bible students, you might know John Calvin and a few others from, you know, the, the 17th, 18th century. But the language and the prophecies from Daniel and the che- teachings of Jesus and what Paul says here doesn't su- seem to support that idea. It seems to point to a specific person with Uh, unnatural powers. And Paul tells us these are satanic, supernatural powers that he has to deceive the world. And the whole systematic context of what takes place during this time, that it's the Antichrist. It's a a person with satanic power. Then in verses 5 through 8, the apostle here reminds them that he had taught them these things while he was still with them previously. And then he mentions there that there is going to be a force restraining the Antichrist from taking power. Uh, most scholars agree that this force is the Holy Spirit in the world today because um, we're talking about satanic, supernatural power. So it's going to take a greater supernatural power to stop what the Antichrist wants. But there's another dynamic involved in this as well. The Holy Spirit lives and abides in the soul of a believer in Jesus. We come to Christ, confess our sins, and then we are born again through the work of the Holy Spirit who now abides in our soul, the spiritual part of us. And it's that Holy Spirit in us that's been holding back evil from completely destroying the world for 2,000 years. It's the Holy Spirit in those um, political leaders in Washington that say, wait a minute, you're not going to pass this law because it takes away the rights of people to choose what they want. You know, And I'm not talking about abortion rights because people say, it's my body, I can do it, I want. I said, unless you want to kill somebody. You know, unless you want to rob somebody, then you don't have that right to do that with your body. This, this whole idea of God, government telling us what we can do with our bodies is a whole new dynamic. So in this place here, the Holy Spirit indwelling the souls of believers, you and I here today, if we've received Christ, we become that vessel that holds back the evil in the world. But make no mistake, It's the Holy Spirit. It's the supernatural power of God in believers that accomplishes this. And when this restraining power of the Holy Spirit in believers is taken out of the world through the rapture, then the Antichrist will come to power. He will be revealed. And all hell breaks out on earth according to Jesus and the book of Revelation chapters 4 through 19. One commentator mentioned that the Holy Spirit will still be working in the world after the departure of the church and people will still come to salvation in the great tribulation period, but the church age, the church time will have ended and the tribulation age will begin. The people that are saved during that time are called tribulation saints and martyrs because they, for the most part, will be executed during that time for not bowing down and following the Antichrist. So when this restraining force of the Holy Spirit is taken out of the world, the Antichrist comes to power, um, we need to tell people, here's what you're going to see. And that's the whole point of this message. Most of the people I talk to about Jesus, do you believe that myth As I mentioned earlier, it's like believing in Santa Claus. You believe in Santa Claus? Well, he's the same as Jesus. And when I sense that, I say, let me tell you, you're going to see people like me vanish from the earth. You're going to watch a huge worldwide rebellion against God. A one world government come to power with one man leading that with supernatural powers. 
And then you'll know everything I told you is true. Because the, the Bible tells us multitudes will be saved in the tribulation. And I think a lot of that is because we're going to tell them the truth before we leave. How many of you have family members? Even children. I've got some children that so I believe in Jesus, but they don't have the evidence of that in their life. So I tell them about this. Here's what you're going to see after I'm gone. It's kind of a sad thing. But we're all going to be gone in one way or another, aren't we? We're all looking for heaven, aren't we? So that's what this is about. It's not about this life that's pretty difficult at times, at least in my opinion. It's about eternal life in Jesus, right? That's why God teaches us these things. This is also important to understand the sequence of these things taking place. Uh, there are many people that embrace what we call a mid-tribulation rapture view. Um, as this restrainer is removed, the Antichrist comes to power in the world in the tribulation period. Then, according to Daniel 7, there will be three and a half years from the middle of the seven-year tribulation period to when Jesus returns with the church to judge the world. So if you're in the tribulation period, you will know the exact day Jesus will come for the church according to Daniel, the prophecies in Daniel chapter 7 through 9. He tells us the exact amount of time. It's exactly three and a half years from the time you see the Antichrist go into the temple at Jerusalem and declare himself that he's God. Jesus said, no man knows the hour or the time of the coming of the day of the Lord. So Jesus had to be speaking of a pre-tribulation rapture view because those in the tribulation they will know the exact day Jesus will come in the final judgment. And just a side note, it's not wor worth wor uh, arguing with people about the timing of this, even though I'm absolutely convinced of it through studying God's word. But if people are not convinced, we'll explain it to them on the way up. <laughs> right? It's... it's, it's I think it's important, as I mentioned earlier, because me knowing Jesus could come today, it really affects some of the choices I make. It affects what I do with my life. It affects what I do today and tomorrow. I think philosophically it's important. But you don't want to divide the church over it. You don't want to get in arguments with believers. Just say, man, study the word. I'll be praying for you. So... Paul tells the church of the signs and wonders the Antichrist will perform, which also reveals to us that miraculous events don't always come from God. I have a feeling that as time goes on, we're going to see more of these kind of supernatural events take place that don't point to God so that people are getting used to the fact that, man, there's UFOs. Man, there's miraculous things happening. I know a lot of unbelievers that tell me they've seen miracles. So the Antichrist is preparing the world for his coming. Jesus is also promising us of his coming. So there's deception all around us, but we have the word of God. The spirit or the influence of the Antichrist is already at work in the world. I can see it. I can feel it. It explains a lot to me. We see that in verses 9 through 10, or actually 9 through 12, which is really what I, I believe the Holy Spirit wanted to focus on today, especially verses 10 through 12. As, as sometimes I mentioned, we see the world going, doing some things that we're like, this doesn't make sense. What are they thinking? How can this be? These are educated, gifted, nice people here, right? What's going on? Verses 9 through 12 tells us this is the spirit of Antichrist already at work and that work is escalating and it's doing it at an extreme rate. Look at verse 9. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power. 
signs and lying wonders. This speaks of supernatural phenomena. And with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, verse 11, for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. Have you ever been delusioned? I was when I saw that Corvette. No, I'm just... Oh. <laughs> I saw myself with a gold chain, shirt like this. No, I'm just kidding. Forgive me. <laughs> I was deluded. But they will have strong delusion that they should believe, notice the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. This is what proves what we believe. If we can have pleasure in unrighteousness, it means we don't believe in God because God is righteous and holy. He sent his son to redeem us out of sin and death. And if you can live in unrighteousness today, you're not saved. You can repent though. You can say, God, I'm having a big battle with grievous sin in my life and I need help. I hate this. I don't want this in my life. And you have church leaders that can help you and pray with you. And I believe God can break the power of grievous sin in human beings' life because he's done that with me. And he's still doing it. The Corvette thing, right? It's not necessarily grievous, but it's stupid. <laughs> you see the new motors in those? Oh, oh. Squirrel. <clears throat> I think verses 9 through 12 really explain what we see in the world today. Wouldn't you agree? There's a strong delusion among those who are perishing in sin. And I, I think this is real eye-opening. Sometimes I'll ask Google what they think about certain things. Google defines delusion as an idiosyncratic idiosyncratic belief or impression that is firmly maintained despite being contradicted by what is generally accepted as reality or rational argument, typically a symptom of mental disorder. Yeah. But get this. Unbelievers would look at me and say, you're delusioned. You believe in Santa Claus, metaphorically. So be aware. That's what's going to happen. So how do we know if we've been delusioned or not? Deluded. How do we know? We just look at God's word, right? This is what tells us we're walking in the truth so that we have this confidence in life because this is all happening right before our eyes. We're watching these things wind up, rev up all around us. And God wants the church to be ready. And he wants the church to have a message. You're the church. He wants you to have this message on your heart and on your mind. When you see these things come to pass, remember what I told you. You can still be saved. Don't take the mark. It's a message. Maybe we should print flyers or t-shirts. I'm not sure, but that's the message because they've rejected the gospel, right? So we have to tell them this message. If they've received the gospel, they'll say, hallelujah, amen. Let's go get a sandwich. But if they've rejected the truth, they will reject any truth. But when they see it happen, they'll know it's the truth. I know that's kind of farm boy mentality, but it, it works. When you see these things come to pass, you will know that what I told you was the truth. A strong delusion. Apparently, this mental disorder is the result of rejecting the truth of God embodied in the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care if they say they're Christians or not. If they support ungodly agendas and unrighteousness, they're not believers. This tell, the word tells us this in 1 John chapter 2. This is how you'll know a tree. 
Jesus said, you'll know a tree by the fruit. So it's not hard for us to see the fruit. Get out of the arguments and look at the fruit. Tell them what God has said about life. Tell them what God has said about salvation. Don't argue about political issues. This is the result of rejecting the truth. A strong delusion to believe the lie. Have you ever wondered, well, what is that lie? I have. I'm like, it doesn't say. It's more of a philosophical statement. It's the lie about God. The lie that sets it up, sets itself up against anything of God. Paul mentions this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I think starting in verse 9, that he says, take your thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ and stand against anything that sets itself up about against the reality of God. This is the lie. I think this lie could be encapsulated um, in something like this, the lie that I can make God whatever I want God to be. The lie that I'm really God. The lie that I can do whatever I want, even though God has spoken. It's the heart of iniquity. Iniquity means doing something that you know is wrong. To minimize God's word to a suggestion or making it non-effective at all. Isn't that what we're seeing? Paul, writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, described these folks, and he said they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power or the authority of God over their lives. They deny God's authority and power by disobeying God's word and premise. The fruit is clear. The evidence is clear. If they disobey God's word openly, they don't belong to God. They rationalize what God has said through this lie that they can interpret God's word through their own mind and their own circumstances. And before we point a lot of fingers, I've done this before. I have rationalized God's word in my life at times to get what I want. And I had to repent Thankfully, this wasn't last week, <laughs> but, you know, I really saw it. I'm like, you know, I'm not letting the authority of God's word dictate what I do. And sometimes it's because I'm hurting and I want to get out. I want to leave. I, I just can't deal with it anymore. And so I make an excuse to do what I want instead of what God says. He said, I want you to walk by faith. I want you to believe that I'm working. I want you to continue to walk in love. And I want you to die to self. Has God said that? Has God really said that? I think he did. And Satan comes and says, has God really said that you have to die to self? Come on. You live in America. Get whatever you want. That was over the Corvette issue with me. So, so apparently... We see this in the world today. They rationalize what God said and they're deluded. But this is so sad. We shouldn't have haughty or prideful hearts towards people we see in this place. Our hearts should break. So I'm praying, God, I want my heart to break when people are in rebellion to God because they've been deceived and deluded. And I've been deceived and deluded many times in my Christian walk. And I want to pray for, for this great compassion for them to try to do everything I can to bring them to the truth. But if they reject it, then I tell them, when you see these things happen, then you'll know I told you the truth. I think this message this morning should greatly motivate us to tell people that when they see this great falling away from God and the rise of a one world ruler with unnatural powers and the true believers of Jesus vanishing from the world, you're in the great tribulation period. You will come under the authority of a one world government that will require that you take a mark in your forehead and your or your hand in order to buy and sell. 
you will see a one world religious system. You will be required by law to submit to this one world ruler for your own good. We see, you know, the beginning of some of these things with some of the mandates the government is trying to pour out right now. It's just the beginning. Forcing people to do something that they're not sure about. So the beginning is here. He's at the door. So this should motivate us greatly. There's not a lot of time. Don't mamby pamby around with people. If they tell you Jesus is Santa Claus, tell them, I want to tell you something because I love you. You're going to see these things happen. And when you do, you can be saved. But don't take the mark. Because you will have to worship the Antichrist and reject Jesus Christ. You can be saved. I believe a lot of people will be saved during the tribulation. Hopefully a couple of my kids. Hopefully a lot of uh, some family members. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I just don't you know, believe in all this cross stuff. It's like, <sighs> that's the world we live in today. You're in the great tribulation. You'll come under a one world government. The church will be gone. And don't buy into this thing of, you know, that Jesus is coming in the rapture. And if you're a real good Christian, you'll get to go to heaven. That's one of the problems I saw with the Left Behind series. It implied that if I'm not really living for God, I'll be left behind. But if you are a believer, you will turn from sin. You will cry out to God. You will get on your face and you will say, God, help me with this sin that's controlling my life. That will prove that you're a believer. So when Jesus comes from the church, you're either a believer or you're not. And we can be deceived by a lot of things, especially when it comes to sin. So man, when I recognize sin in my life, I go, that's sin. I hate it. God, help me to break free. I don't want this. And you don't stop until God brings freedom. I have been set free from every grievous sin you can name, I think. Maybe a couple, but not there. But, so I know God can break the power of sin in a human being's life. But if you practice religion and you don't get, want to get right with him, you'll be in bondage to sin. And you'll have this big question mark in your life. Jesus is coming for the church. If you're born again, you're going in the rapture. Whether you believe in a pre-mid, post-toasty view, whatever the case may be, you're going. Because you're born again. And you've got to keep that in your mind. It could be today. As we go out this week, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Can I ask you about Jesus? What do you think about him? Oh, it's like Santa Claus. Let me tell you something, buddy. Here's what you're going to see next. You've got to do it because Jesus loves them. He will save people in the tribulation the same way we're saved, through the shed blood of Jesus, by God's grace, through faith. God will give them that gift of faith to believe in that place. And can you imagine the joy for all eternity? Having somebody come up and say, you don't remember me. But man, I was ready to knock your head off at Walmart. You were telling me about these things. And when I saw it, I gave my life to Jesus. I was martyred in the tribulation age. And I'll be like, wow, man. Another guy will say, World War II got me. And I'll say, it was ice cream and Twinkies. <laughs> not, not really. But... <laughs> In that place, this is, this is such a message for today. Tell them you can repent. You can cry out to God when you see these things. Don't take the mark. You know, and finally, this morning, one commentator, I was uh, listening actually to a podcast he gave. Uh, people asked me, do you work out? And I go, well, it's, at my age, it's physical therapy. But I do that and I listen to podcasts while I'm, while I'm trying to keep my body going until Jesus comes back. And uh, uh, he, he said, you know, the world is controlled by mammon. Mammon? 
Is that any relation to the woolly mammoth? It's not. Mammon is a term that's used for a financial power. So the world is controlled through financial power. Would you agree with that? Have you ever heard of big pharma? Oh, yeah. How about big media? Who's controlling it? How about our government? Who's controlling it? It's certainly not God. It would be nice if it was that way. So we live in this fallen world controlled by mammon. I'm here to tell you today, don't let it control you. The government might come out and say, unless you do this, we're cutting off your social security for me. You know, my social security, I need it to buy my walker, you know? So, I mean, whatever it is, if you're working somebody, if you don't do this, you're going to lose your job. I want you to pray and seek the Lord and have a testimony for the truth of God and believe that, that you have a church in your life that's going to help you. You have Jesus Christ who's going to help you. Almost all of us as, uh, as Christians have been, been um, confronted because of our faith in our workplace. I was called in to, in the mid-90s to the, uh, they called it a diversity council at where I worked for uh, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, and they they said, you can never speak of Jesus on this property again. And I said, well, your, your uh, policy here says that if somebody asks me about that, that I can. Well, we've had reports that you, you talk about Jesus all the time. I'm like, who, me? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it was so funny. The supervisor that was there trying to, you know, say, we, we keep getting these reports. And Joe, you got to tone it down, man. And some of these guys are going to throw you off a train one of these days. And I'm like, you know, Jesus saved my life. I gave him my testimony and he started crying. He said, I used to walk with Jesus and this job has taken my life, mammon. And I said, bro, I mean, I walked to the side of his desk. I'm like, bro, do you have a Bible? And he said, yeah, it's right over there. I'm like, man. I know you're in a hard place. And I, and I know you don't think there's a way, but there is. If you start getting into the word, you start doing what God has said, you might lose your stock options in this job, but you're a union railroad engineer. You can come work with me. <laughs> you know, I only work four days a week. It's nice. <laughs> So don't let mammon control you. Don't let the government control you. It's always great to get counsel when you're in those places. You know, we've had family members that said, hey, pray for me, man. My employer just said, if I don't follow this mandate, I'm going to lose my job. But I don't believe in it. I think there's something wrong with it. And so we prayed. God has worked out something for them. And uh, you need counsel. You need others to pray with you. You can't be like, oh, I'm not going to do it. Rah, 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 rah. You know, you got to be like, God, help me. Because you might want me to give a great witness right now. And I already have the message. It's from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, right? You guys got it? You got the message? Amen. Let's all stand together. We'll ask a worship leader to come in if they're here this, this second service. Lord, we do pray that you'd help us, oh God, to just understand the times we're in. Help me, because man, I, I just don't think I get it sometimes. I, I'm tied up with so many piddly little things. Help us, God, um, to know that you're at the very door and we have the message for the world. We can tell them, and if they reject Christ, then we have to tell them, you will see all these things happen. God, if there's anyone here this morning that knows they're not saved, that right now in the privacy of their own heart and mind, they would say, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I want to have the assurance of eternal life and the truth of your word in my life. I've lived in deception. I've lived in bondage to sin. God, I cry out to you today. I know you want to save me and you have supernatural power to do it through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. God, help us in this place 
to come to faith, to come to power, to come to reason with Almighty God who created all of this to accomplish his purposes in us. And we pray in your name. Trust what you say that you're good and your love is great and I'm broken inside and I give you my life. Yes, Jesus. I may be weak. I may be weak. Your spirit. That's our desire. We want to give you our lives, God, but I, without the Holy Spirit, man, we're just, and the Word of God, we're not capable. It's got to be a work of grace by the Spirit or else we would boast. Help us, Lord. I know you will. God, and as we go into this Christmas season, I, I know I struggle during the holidays because of um, just broken family issues. It's always plagued me, even after being a believer. And you always remind me, Joe, this is Christmas is not about you. It's about Jesus. Help us, God, to have that mantra as uh, maybe some of us su suffer like I do in the holidays. And you remind us, it's not about you. It's about Jesus. The birth of the Savior coming to the world. And we can always rejoice in that. Amen? Amen? We can always rejoice in the birth of a Savior to this world. We can always rejoice in the gift that God has given us, which brings joy to our heart and heals some of the hurt that we've had in life. Man, life will grind you to powder. But hopefully, that'll bring you to Christ. Give you hope. There's nothing in this world that can keep us going but Jesus. I pray God's blessing upon you today. You have this message on your mouth. You would practice it in the mirror, in the bathroom, before you go to work, before you go to the markets, before you go anyway, anywhere. Remember, you'll see these things happen if you reject Christ, but you can be saved. We pray that in Jesus' name. Let's give God glory. Amen. Thank you, Lord.